First of all, uh, please join me in thanking Peggy Hamburg for that remarkable speech. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we're joined by uh, uh, three remarkable additional folks to our panel who I'll very quickly introduce. You have their bios. Uh, to my left, uh, Ruben Jeffrey III, who is a uh, senior advisor here at CSIS. Uh, spent 22 years uh, at Wa on Wall Street very successfully and since then has done a um, remarkable sequence of things and most recently was Under Secretary for Economic, Energy and Agricultural Affairs at the Department of State. Prior to that was a Senior Director and Special Assistant to the President of the National Security Council uh, uh, with responsibilities for international economic affairs. Uh, played a key role uh, as a representative of the Pentagon at a key moment in the um, creation of the Coalition Provincial Authority. Uh, played a key role in pr advising the President after 9-11 in the redevelopment of <coughs> Lower Manhattan. And I could go on and on, but um, in any case, quite a remarkable um, array. Uh, Tom Boyke, you've seen um, the, the paper that he's written. Uh, Tom trained as a biologist and historian at Columbia. Uh, went on to uh, a, a very distinguished uh, uh, tenure at the Stanford Law School, uh, was president of the Law Review, uh, went from there to uh, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office where he was a senior director there on intellectual property issues and was a, a very important personality in the negotiations with Korea and China uh, uh, in a very sensitive and complex set of issues around the intellectual property rights and safety issues. Um, Henry Chen is the senior safety and regulatory officer at the Coca-Cola company, the sort of uh, gold standard for, uh, for these safety issues. Um, uh, he served for th 30 years at the uh, National Association, National Food Processors Association. He's a chemist by training, uh, completed his PhD at USC. Uh, prior to that was an undergraduate at Berkeley where he returned as a post postgrad. So long loyalties to those two great universities. So let me, let me try to kick off the first round of our discussion and ask a very broad question and ask Tom to sort of perhaps kick off the answer. And the question is, we've heard uh, Dr. Hamburg's discussion around the agenda that we face, which is a very complex, daunting agenda, and that the U.S. is seeking to be more engaged along these multiple levels. Tell us a bit from where you, from as you look out, um, what the major challenges are going to be in achieving success, both in terms of U.S. policy, the kind of uh, past efforts that we've had and what those experiences might, might tell us. And looking five years out or ten years out, what might success look like for us? Maybe you could just offer some quick comments and we'll invite Henry and and Ruben to, 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 to weigh in, and then we'll come back to Peggy to, for, for her thoughts. Sure, I'd be happy to. First, let me start by thanking Steve and CSIS for the uh, invitation to participate in this great panel, as well as for their support in publishing my paper on food and drug import safety. I also want to say what an honor it is to share the stage with Commissioner Hamburg and Ruben Jeffrey and Dr. Chin in this discussion. Uh, let me begin by saying that I very much agree with uh, Commissioner Hamburg's characterization of the food and drug import safety problem, as well as the need for a paradigm shift in the U.S. government's approach to the issue. Unsafe food and drug products at this point are no longer just simply issues of domestic public health threats that uh, can be addressed with um, stronger border control or port inspection. Uh, they really have become, food and drug import safety has really become a global health problem. Uh, the burden, health burden, the heavy health burden of foodborne disease and contaminated and adulterated foods and drugs really experienced internationally, uh, in importing and exporting countries alike. And for all the reasons that the commissioner cited, the exponential growth in the food and drug uh, trade the uh, proliferation of sources of these products, particularly in developing countries with uh, less regulatory capacity, as well as the complexity of the products in the supply chains. All these mean that no one national regulatory authority, not even one as good as the FDA, um, can alone ensure the safety of the food and drugs that we import. So you need a new strategy. And I think the overarching strategy that FDA 
has put forward is, is a good one. And it's consistent with strategies that have been successfully employed to address uh, other types of global health threats that uh, cross borders, like infectious diseases that cross borders with trade and travel. Uh, first, they've called for measures to improve control and monitoring at uh, the point of production of these products and talked about traceability, uh, accountability for local manufacturers, as well as cooperation and information sharing with uh, regulators. Next, the commissioner has talked about uh, the need to invest in, in, in uh, indigenous regulatory capacity in developing countries so that they may themselves ensure the safety and uh, quality of the food and drugs produced in that jurisdiction. But she talked about the case for the buy-in for exporting countries in this initiative around uh, uh, food and drug uh, import safety, specifically talking about the benefits that accrue to the, or the consumers in those countries themselves who really are consuming the same products, the same foods and drugs that we are uh, consuming and are exposed to the same threats. And also talked about how improving the safety of these products improves the brand of uh, those exporting countries. And last, she talked about the need to coordinate with uh, regional and international authorities on this issue. So in a sense, this is a very classic uh, public health strategy in dealing with uh, transnational threats, and I think it's the right one. I think the challenge to get to your question about uh, the success of this effort and its feasibility will be in the details and the implementation. Just to throw out a few issues now and then open it up for discussion. Around traceability, a lot of the question will ultimately be around the scope and compliance with those requirements. The 2002 Bioterrorism Act, for instance, provides for traceability of some foods, uh, but doesn't extend to foreign producers and compliance with it has been lousy. Uh, a recent OIG report has determined that you have roughly 40% compliance with that requirement. Uh, to the issue of regulatory capacity building, there's a bottomless need in developing countries for regulatory capacity building. And I think the question will be, from the FDA standpoint, what sort of political mandate will the FDA from, have from Congress? What sort of resources will it have in order to start to address those needs? But also uh, whether or not those resources will be deployed in a risk-based, sustainable manner. Historically, as I discussed in the paper, this has not been the case. You haven't seen uh, FDA really have the ability to engage in this type of regulatory capacity building, and the resources have gone to countries typically like Egypt or Colombia, which are not necessarily the producers of uh, high-volume, high-risk products. Uh, the third issue would be whether or not the uh, move towards this strategy can be done in a way that's consistent with international trade commitments. And I'd love to hear uh, from Jeffrey's thoughts on this as well. Uh, I certainly agree with the commissioner that um, the idea behind food and drug safety is reaffirming of trade. The question is, is in this economic environment and the political, domestic political environment around trade policy, whether or not the bills that emerge from Congress will be supportive of that goal. Uh, the last issue I would say is I think the commissioner is quite right in uh, emphasizing the need for corporate support and accountability as being a foundation for uh, moving forward with these efforts. I think the big question is going to be how and what blend of uh, what will be the characteristics and the mix of carrots and sticks employed in order to foster that support and capability. And I really think Moving forward on those types of four examples will determine where we are in five years on this problem. It really does, as the commissioner outlined, require a paradigm shift. Thank you. Ruben, would you like to add? Yeah, Steve, further? thank you. And I want to add my thanks, uh, Dr. Amber, to you for, for being here today and for your service to our country and, importantly, for really the extraordinary record uh, of the FDA over time and keeping you know, food and medical products and medicine safe in America. There's no, and we're the exemplar uh, in, in the world of kind of best practices in this regard, and we can all have confidence under your leadership that will continue to be the case, so thank you. Uh, just a couple things to um, add to uh, Tom's commentary and stress the magnitude of the implementation challenge here when it comes to import safety across the suite of products from food to uh, medical products. It requires success over, the, over time. It's going to put a premium on communication collaboration and coordination across a variety of fronts, starting in our own government. 
Not that the interagency process doesn't always work seamlessly, but there's certainly a lot of equities at stake in any one of these issue sets. And you know, the departments and agencies, there's FDA, there's agriculture, there's state, there's USDR that gets into the, into the, in the trade aspects. And it's very important that we as a government continue to be lined up in terms of definition of priorities, uh, sense of desired outcomes, and then negotiating an implementation strategy. Secondly, at the international level, we've got the comp uh, a, a, a variety of fora through which we can achieve the objectives of food and medical product safety. First at the bilateral level, and the issue sets are very different depending upon the particular trading partner. Take China as one of your 150 sources of imports. There, the issues are one of scale and economics. Just the pure sh size of China is overwhelming. They have 200 million, 200 million farms, however defined. You can't inspect them all. So it's absolutely imperative that we have the right understandings at the right levels, as we've begun to do. We've made significant progress with the Chinese, like they and we both recognize that we have uh, a long way to go. Uh, and prioritizing, and they've pursuant to those agreements, and Tom, you were involved in putting these together, uh, there are now third-party certifications of certain export facilities. We have inspectors there. They have some people here. Again, it's the beginnings uh, of a process we'll hope, which will hopefully lead to greater uh, confidence on both our parts of product integrity going in, going in both directions. Africa, you alluded to this as well, Tom, challenge completely different. It's one of development and developmental capacity. I mean, agriculture, it, not to generalize in Africa, every country is different, of course, is clearly important for the basic food supply, the health and welfare of the people, and also in certain countries as a source of export earnings. So supporting these countries through our own bilateral efforts and through the development community writ large in improving their own domestic quality for their own benefit, and then also translating into that to the requisite protections where exports for exports coming into our market and other markets is an absolutely critical dimension to addressing the problem longer term. And it clearly goes beyond the purview of the FDA. The FDA can't begin to take on all these responsibilities, but it speaks back to the importance of making sure we as a government have a government as a whole, as a whole approach to this suite of problems. And then finally, there are all these various multilateral forum. And every region has a regional grouping of which we are a part. I don't need to name them all. You've got the G8, which historically, or the G7, has taken on food security and health issues. Query whether or not some of these challenges will now get taken up by the G20. I would suspect that, I, personally, I think that these are, these are challenges, um, given the stakes, that are well worth the while of, 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 of an institutionalized G20 uh, process in the fullness of time. But how these organizations and groupings take on these challenges in a way that is supportive of solving the problem, i.e. assuring food safety, while at the same time does not uh, interfere with the normal flow of appropriate trade, commerce, and investment activity. Is, that's, if you didn't have enough to do, <laughs> that's just another layer of uh, international considerations. Henry, would you like to ask? Add a few comments. Uh, well, first, thank you for uh, for inviting me to be part of this distinguished uh, group. Um, I feel a little bit out of place here, uh, but uh, um, I, I wanted to, to emphasize a little bit of the remarks that were made by Ruben and also, of course, uh, Dr. Hamburg. That you know, um, applauding FDA on on what's uh, on, on the initiatives going forward. Uh, the food industry has always felt that a strong FDA is, is vital to, to uh, not only food safety, but not only food safety, but, but consumer confidence in food safety, because that's really very, obviously very important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and um, um, <coughs> the, um, the, some, the initiatives that uh, uh, Dr. Hamburg has talked about in terms of, of um, Building local capacity, getting uh, troops on the ground uh, at, at the uh, in, in the countries that that. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you just fine up here. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> you see it, Tom. It's, there you go. Okay. 
Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, um, hopefully, uh, you heard my initial comments saying that uh, you know, the food industry is very supportive of FDA. We've uh, been uh, supportive of strong FDA. Uh, we believe F uh, strong FDA is vital to having consumer confidence in the safety of the food supply. Um, and the initiatives that, that, uh, that Dr. Hamburg has, has outlined in terms of uh, having uh, additional capacities on the ground, building relationships uh, in those countries, moving responsibility further down into the supply, uh, further up into the supply chain. Um, you know, those are all kinds of things that food companies do when they go into those markets. And so, in, in many ways, um, what FDA is, is doing is, is mirroring what you know, the most responsible companies are doing in those uh, developing markets already. But having the clout of FDA and, and, and FDA bringing resources in, you know, is certainly going to uh, be, you know, a great uh, uh, improvement. And, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, it, it will improve. And, and the FDA's uh, intention to, to be collaborative, and you know, I think the food industry would really want to share uh, some of our uh, best practices in terms of how we do audits of suppliers, how we qualify suppliers, how we trace in our ingredients. We, we really would like to be able to share some of those best practices with FDA. Peggy, shall we come back to you for some reactions? Well, you know, I, number one, I'm in, enormously encouraged by the, the level of, of support uh, for what we're trying to do and, and the recognition of the complexity of the challenge, the time urgency of the challenge, um, but the fact that we simply must make this a priority and that if we're really going to address this problem over the longer term, we cannot lose time going forward now. It is just a very, very difficult undertaking on every level. You know, I tried to lay out something about the nature and scope of the challenge in terms of the expanding global markets. But when you think about what are sort of the, the modalities in which an agency like FDA needs to implement, it's also very, very complex. You know, internally it requires working with partners in government that, um, that historically we may not have always worked as directly with, you know, many of which we have, but, but aligning the, the trade and commerce issues the, um, the diplomacy and international relations issues, the issues with, with um, the Department of Agriculture and other components of, of government, and finding a way to strike the balance between what are the compelling public health needs and what are the other um, priorities of government, because clearly, we want those interests to all align. The truth is they don't always align, and so obviously as FDA commissioner, part of my responsibility is to always make sure that the public issues and concerns get fully on the table and addressed, um, and that they get the primacy that they need and deserve, but framing those in the broader context of, of all of the tools and the infrastructure for actually implementing solutions in an international context. Um, the, the second you know, great challenge of the sort of logistics of this, I think, is the, the global governance issues. We have developed and will continue to develop bilateral and multilateral um, arrangements. That gets us moving forward, but it still is a fragmented, mm -hmm. piecemeal approach. And I think you know, what we really want to strive for is increasing harmonization of standards and broader sharing of both information and technical expertise, um, as well as just plain old resources. Um, but there isn't really a clear governance structure mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. issue. Um, the World Health Organization obviously plays an important and vital role. Um, there are uh, FAO, the Food um, International Food Organization, plays an important and vital role. There, there 
other dominant players like the European Union and the drug arena, the, their EMEA, which is the FDA equivalent, and their other very strong um, uh, regulatory authorities out there that, that sort of provide some informal uh, governance. But, but, you know, I think it, we do need to think about um, if we want to really institutionalize some of these approaches and really have a strong foundation on which to build going forward, do we need some innovation in right. that regard? And it's made even more complex by the fact that these issues, we're talking here about both food and, yeah. and drugs and devices. Not every regulatory authority is structured in the same way. In fact, we are the exception to the rule um, doing drugs, devices, and medical products, as well as, as now tobacco products and a few uh, other important um, consumer goods. So, so that is a major challenge. What is really exciting to me, despite all of the bumps in the road before us, is that there is, I think, this, this, this strong appreciation of just how important <coughs> these issues are and the fact that CSIS is both hosting this forum but has, has taken this major advance that you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks to, to, to really include this issue as part of the overall global health strategy and the fact that uh, people in very different roles than health, people that work on economic development issues, people that work on, on trade issues, people that work on diplomacy issues are also starting to see that this is an issue that they need to fully engage on and they need to work with us. You know, it gives me hope that moving forward we can accomplish a lot. And finally, industry is such a critical partner. And as you said, um, we can learn a lot from industries such as Coca-Cola that have a long history and a strong track record in assuring the safety of the, the supply chain. And I think that, that when we think about how we're going to extend our global reach, and work with, with key partners, um, industry is, is an essential uh, partner in that effort. Thank you. Ruben, can you comment a little more about what kind of diplomatic strategy in this situation is going to make sense? Um, we're in a period of pretty rapid and very ambiguous transition where the G8, we're not sure where the G8 will migrate and whether, you know, what will it look like in two years when, it's, when we're the host if it still exists, and we've got a G20 that's rapidly taking shape, and that's just one piece of the puzzle. You wanna, and yep, first, just to, I want to make an obvious point, but right, related to the attention of not just Americans, but the world community on this issue set, and that is simply that a consumer in China or an African country, no less than one in the United States, in this world of rapid communications, they know a problem when they see it and they don't like it and they hold their governments accountable. And I think that's a good thing for maintaining momentum on an international process or series of processes. I think, Steve, your, um, your, your question's a tough one because there, there's not an easy answer here because there are a lot of in place mechanisms, uh, and there's institutional structures, you, you mentioned the UN ones, there, there are all these various region, regional ones, different countries are organized in different ways in terms of, in terms of how they regulate. Um, so I think we've got to do is sort of simultaneously move on the existing fronts and through those, one identifies the really big issues, whether it's a particular product of concern or a particular region of concern. And as to those issues, and we as a country, and as a matter of di diplomacy, need to think long and hard whether or not it's m better to elevate them to some wider group, whether it's the UN mechanism or the G20 or something else. But there has to be some kind of structure since, since any one organization can't deal with all of the issues because they're, they're, they're so broad, they're so diverse, they're so, they're so numerous, whereby we in our own minds prioritize what, the, what those issues are and um, bring them to the fore in these broader um, globally representative groupings, again, be it the UN or, or, the, mm -hmm. G, or the G20, mm -hmm. so that there's some real concerted, organized action on a, on a common basis to address the particular issue. Tom, do you have anything to add on that? Sure. Um, I think the comments have been really great. Uh, I uh, agree with uh, um, both Ruben and Commissioner Hamburg's discussion of efforts, uh, particularly the Commissioner's discussion of 
uh, need for new diplomatic approaches. Um, I think the last administration had a fairly mixed record in pursuing bilateral agreements around trying to improve food and drug safety. Uh, I think we uh, achieved a memorandum of agreement of somewhat varying quality with China and the efforts to negotiate those agreements with India didn't, didn't uh, get off the ground. Uh, I think that um, some of the issue will be moving towards, and I think the Commissioner's comments in identifying this as a more global health issue I think will help in the sense of not, no longer targeting countries uh, as particularly bad actors, maybe moving from more of a bilateral model of these contentious negotiations more to an international model I think will help. I think more attention needs to be uh, paid to uh, what is in it for these countries, the buy-ins. Um, I think regulatory, having resources to actually provide regulatory capacity building is certainly one of those carrots. There is a great FDA pilot program right now about the secure supply chain initiative looking at preferential access to uh, drug manufacturers that meet verified quality standards. That's a good approach as well. But I do think you need a more integrated interagency approach involving uh, USCR, Commerce, and others in terms of moving forward this approach. That's both because of tapping other sources of expertise, but also other sources of linkage, uh, other mm -hmm. things that you can provide to move this debate forward. But I also think better use needs to be made of international fora. I am a, a fan of uh, pursuing initiatives in codex around these issues, mm -hmm. moving towards more commodity-specific um, uh, production standards mm -hmm. for high, uh, high risk products would be a better way to go, in my view, than trying to pursue these on a bilateral basis. Mm -hmm. Henry, do you agree with that? Yes, yeah, so I, you know, I, I was just going to mention that, that you know, Codex, uh, in, in the food area, uh, obviously Codex is, is a forum for right. talking about uh, mm -hmm. harmonization of uh, international standards on, on foods. Um, there, so so there, there is that forum, uh, probably one of the things that, uh, you know, unfortunately, Codex does has, have a reputation of not moving very swiftly. <laughs> so one of the things that, that you know, could, could, uh, uh, we could ben all benefit from is some way of uh, moving Codex along mm -hmm. uh, a little bit uh, more swiftly. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, as we're talking about harmonization of international standards, I just came from a, a, a meeting, I guess a week ago, where they were talking about uh, regulators from different countries were talking about uh, their efforts at harmonizing their uh, regulations. And we had a presentation from uh, China talking about they're trying to harmonize regulations between China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And you know, they have some challenges. We had a presentation from uh, governments in Southeast Asia uh, trying to harmonize regulations between uh, uh, Singapore and, and Taiwan and the Philippines and all that. So, and so, so there's a lot of effort, a lot of attention going on in terms of harmonizing uh, regulations. Um, I, unfortunately, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, we, can't, we got to where we are in terms of the different standards over a period of you know, many, uh, many decades. It will take maybe a little bit of time to unravel and, and harmonize, but I, I think mm. we all agree that uh, harmonized standards uh, are the way to go. And harmonized stand and this is where FDA comes in because FDA is really powerful in the sense that they are a science-based organization. And so the things that uh, Commissioner Hamburg was talking about about risk-based inspections. Uh, you're talking about traceability and having that risk-based, I, I think goes a long way. I mean, you don't want to waste your resources on things that are low risk. But on the other hand, you want to focus on those things that are high risk. Um, so, uh, and also in the area of uh, talking about harmonization, it's interesting that as we are gathered here, there's another conference elsewhere in the city. Of course, I guess that's not too unusual for Washington, but that there is a uh, conference that's going on called the Global uh, Food Safety Initiative Conference, where uh, a large number of uh, multinational companies and other food companies are, getting get, are gathered together talking about, uh, you know, harmonizing or developing a standard to, or procedure to harmonize, uh, you know, audit standards and, and those kinds of things. So. 
Thank you. Why don't we turn to our audience for some comments uh, and questions. Just uh, stand up or put your, um, yes, we, uh, here and here on this side, let's start. We'll gather together three, uh, yes, please. Just identify yourself. And, and there's a microphone, Seth Gannon, who's been very instrumental helping us put this together. Bring that over. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jared Favoli. Jared Favoli from Dow Jones. This question is for Mr. Chin. Trying to figure out, does Coca-Cola support the proposed uh, food inspection user fees? Okay, hold on that for one second. Back here. Hi, <laughs> Bill Thoat with uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. Have you taken a look at, you talked a little bit about um, uh, some of the penalties you're putting on uh, foreign importers. Have you looked at, um, from their perspective, what the trade-off is between the risk of getting those penalties and the cost to their business of improving food inspection, because that's what will drive their business. Right down here in front. Thank you very much. Raghubir Gaur from India, Asia today. My question is for the commissioner. Excellent talk, of course. Um, one, what sort of agreement do you have with India? as far as food safety and imports of medicinal drugs are concerned. At the same time, Ayurvedic or herbal medicine are talk of the town in America or around the globe today. If you have considered or if uh, you have got any request from any Indian facilities. And finally, as far as terrorists are concerned, they try to hurt people in many ways and now they may be looking through some food and medicines and so on. So what kind of, what sort of uh, safety are you considering for the terrorist attacks? Okay, just one more Jim Harrington here. And, and then we'll come back to our panelists for responses. Thank you, Jim Harrington from the National Institutes of Health, uh, Fogarty International Center. Your excellent talk, Commissioner, thanks so much. My question is on the bigger picture, uh, what about a framework convention on food and drug safety, not unlike the framework uh, convention on tobacco control? Would that be something that would help harmonize and, and bring to bear the countries that actually would sign on that and ratify it? Okay. So, Henry, we had one specific question for you. Maybe you'd like to, and then we'll turn to Dr. Hamburg on the broader ones. Well, I, actually, I, I don't think I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm not actually the right person to address that. that that's something that our uh, people on, on uh, uh, our, uh, our government affairs people are, you know, better uh, equipped to to address. I'm I'm the science and regulatory guy. I'm not the, uh, you know, the uh, the user fee guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dr. Amber. Well, maybe I can use that to pivot <laughs> to an answer on, on the other because I think in a way what the gentleman from Booth, Alan Hamilton was was discussing was the issue about relative incentives and disincentives to participate in in the marketplace and you know it is true that there are importers of varying sizes and and certain demands and and expectations and penalties on smaller importers you know does create um, a potential concern for them I guess I would say that whether you're large or small the products that you bring into this country uh, need to be safe and the importer does have a, a clear responsibility um, and, it, and needs to be held accountable for, for being able to assure the safety of those products. I think that we need to be willing to work with those importers uh, to help them better understand how to fulfill their responsibility in terms of um, the safety and security of, of the supply chain. As we touched on earlier, industry has a lot of, of interest uh, and experience in this arena as well, because in the final analysis, if the products aren't safe, and particularly if they cause serious problems uh, in people in this country or anywhere else in the world, um, that's going to be even worse for the business of those importers. So I think we view it as a partnership we want to work Together, we want to create the support and incentives to assure compliance rather than enforcement and penalties. But you need to have the enforcement and penalties that you can bring to bear um, when necessary. Um, with respect to the question about um, US, India. US India, very, very important relationship. 
uh, both with respect to drugs and uh, food imports. Um, we have a lot of working relationships with India, and we have two new offices in terms of, uh, of an actual on-the-ground uh, presence. I'd have to get back to you with respect to what you know specific signed agreements we have. I'm not I'm not certain of that, uh, but there's been an explosion of activity in India in terms of of medical uh, products generic drugs, of course, being uh, very well recognized, but also now, you know, more um, innovative uh, products as well. And that relationship uh, and our ability to work with those companies and, and have on-the-ground presence uh, is very, very key. And, and India, as you well know, is, is a leader in certain food products, particularly spices, which are highly vulnerable to contamination and so again you know really working with India to make sure that that the the products are produced in ways that are in compliance with international and US safety standards is is absolutely key and in the interests of, of both of our countries and I expect that we'll be working more and more closely with India over the time to come and the framework convention question. the framework convention you know, it's an interesting idea. Interestingly, there have been very, very few international um, uh, conventions um, around health, with the tobacco um, uh, framework convention being one and the biological weapons convention being another. I, I kind of think this issue is, is not one that's cut out for a convention per se. I think that you would end up actually potentially causing more harm because you'd, the sort of specific things that you'd lay out would actually box you in rather than enable the kind of broader um, engagement and commitment that you need. But I think that the strategy of really trying to convene in a more international way and really uh, support different kinds of fora for addressing questions of, of, of harmonization and, and coordination uh, is very, very key, and we need to do more about that. And as we do that, I mean, I liked your notion of moving forward with the sort of structures um, and institutions that are already in place, but, but thinking about how we might reformulate as we better understand our needs, as we also experiment and, and learn about what works and what doesn't. Um, but I think we need more um, global fora for talking about these issues and acting on these issues. And they, I think we need a, a sort of a, a multiplicity of different strategies, though. Sure. Um, just to respond to a couple of those points. On the liability and penalty side, um, it's an important issue. Um, I will say that it's true that from a regulator's perspective, the costs of regulating imported products and their production are a lot, a lot higher. And there is a justification for uh, um, having penalties to encourage uh, better production, uh, safer, higher quality production of those products in light of those higher costs imposed on US regulators to try to ensure the safety of these products. I will say that being said, there's an important issue around uh, least developed countries for whom, uh, for which rather, uh, agriculture is a, a sole area often of comparative advantage. And the question of how these countries, small producers in these countries, can meet uh, rising uh, standards is, is a real one. And I do think there needs to be an attempt made to try to facilitate, uh, when things are talked about in the paper, is possibility of uh, collectives um, as a way of trying to pool resources to allow them to meet these mm -hmm. standards. But it's a real it's a real issue. On the framework convention, I think uh, I concur with the uh, commissioner that international approaches are important, but you do have both the SPS and the TBT agreement already with extensive provisions on harmonization around safety mm -hmm. uh, and safety for food and drugs. So I think you'd have a hard time moving forward with the convention uh, on that same subject when you already have those agreements. We also in the US don't have, uh, have had a difficult relationship with these public health framework conventions to begin with. Um, tobacco being the uh, obvious example. So I'm, I'm not sure that model is really is, would be the best, although 
the international approach, I think, is the right one. Yeah, listening to these various responses, it sort of underscores the need for leveraging the resources that exist. There's the FDA, there's a broader regulatory community in the U.S., there are all these multilateral forums, and the private sector really does play, play, play a key role. I won't comment on user fees. I'll leave that to the government affairs people, wherever. But the, um, the resource of the private sector to monitor supply chain management, assure best practices, consistent quality throughout the supply chain, to train people, professionals, young people from around the world in their companies and in, 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 in the ways of doing safe and, and, and effective business and production is, is absolutely critical. So that partnership with government and governmental bodies is one that, that needs to continue, it's already strong, but needs to continue to be, to be, to be strengthened and reinforced. We're getting to the end here, so I'd like to, there's a woman right here in the middle here. Hi, Caitlin Christensen with the Global Health Technologies Coalition. Um, it's evident that the health of non-U.S. populations is a major priority of this administration, and enhancing national regulatory authorities in the developing world would be a significant step to improving global health. Um, another issue is the role that the FDA plays in the review of products that, that the FDA can and does play in the review of products that are intended for diseases found in the developing world or diseases not primarily found in the U.S. The European Medicines Agency, or the European equivalent of the FDA, has recently implemented a new process by which it approves or it reviews products intended for non-European populations in partnership with the WHO called the Article 58. I'm curious whether you see a potential role or similar process that the FDA might consider in that regard uh, to help with the review of products for the developing world. Thank you. Let's take one more question, question comment, please. Uh, Commissioner, I'm Rob Cortell, a former U.S. Federal Maritime Commissioner and father of the container security paradigm. I'm also chairman and CEO of Intellix, which built PREDICT. And uh, when I walked in today, I didn't realize you were going to announce it. <laughs> so as soon as I walk out, I'm going to link to your website, from my website. Um, uh, but we're, A, we're honored to be involved with FDA, and B, uh, it took a great deal of courage to actually push through these kinds of technologies because they really are advanced beyond what people are typically used to. Um, this is a conference, so my question is, however, um, this is a conference about uh, food imports. But I would be curious about what you're thinking about regulation of domestic products that you regulate as well, because many of the same technologies can be applied in this space as well. Thank you. Can we come back to the commissioner? Okay. Well, I'll start with the, the last ch question first. Um, you know, I really think we need to think about many of these strategies not as international and domestic, but as common mm -hmm. problems in a, in a dramatically fluid and interconnected world and the same kinds of, of strategies that we need to apply internationally, we need to apply at home, the shift from a reactive mode to a preventive mode, the focus on um, you know, really assuring the safety and security of the supply chain, uh, the notion of working in critical partnership with both industry and domestically with state and local uh, health authorities. Um, you know, I think that we're talking about import safety in a sort of targeted way in part because it's been underappreciated and underaddressed and, and because of the, the, the growing number of, of imports of all kinds of consumer goods into this country, there really is an urgent need to step up to the plate and really um, begin to do things differently and, and to acknowledge and respond um, to what is a very serious vulnerability and threat to health. That doesn't mean that domestically uh, we don't have, have a job to do and we don't require some of that same paradigm shift. And I think the overall message um, you know, that I hope to convey is that, that FDA is a critical player domestically and internationally in promoting and protecting the health of the public and that in order to do so, we need to be adequately supported. We need um, the appropriate authorities. We need to be in a position to truly leverage science and technology. Um, and we need to work in full partnership. Um, 
the other question was about um, our role in helping to support um, access to medical products in other countries. And of course, we do have to operate within a very well-defined and scrutinized legal and regulatory framework. And you know, the, the approach being taken by Europe isn't one that we can just adopt uh, here at home. Uh, but we do have a commitment to trying to make um, medical products more available around the world. In the PEPFAR program, we were able to, to go forward with an with a, a, a innovative approach, um, what's called the tentative approval process, um, but it's more than tentative. Um, and more than 100 products have been made available for use through the PEPFAR program in the developing world. Um, so we will continue to work on, on those efforts. Um, it is a priority, and I think that you know another aspect of what we're trying to do through this import safety and the broader framing um, that we're applying to import safety is to support the capacity of other countries to be able to um, make innovative medical products um, and safe foods more available for their own um, communities. I think we're at the end of our time here. So please join me in thanking Commissioner Hamburg and our, and our other panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was fun.